here. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to this session here. My name is DJ. I'm with the Foundry. I'm a creative specialist working here out of LA. And uh, Foundry is very excited to present this panel for you today with our customer, VR Playhouse. They'll be featuring some of their work they've done as far as um, what they may have worked on, like a huge project, you could say, for Mercedes-Benz, as well as among other projects that they have, they're, they're going to show you today. So without further ado, please let me just uh, introduce to you Darren Turner, CCO, Ian Forrester, CEO, and Leo Vizzali, executive producer. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, I guess I don't need this, right? No, here. Can, can you guys hear me OK? Here. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, if you're here, give yourselves a big round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so as DJ mentioned, I'm Ian Forrester. I'm the CEO and co-founder of VR Playhouse. And uh, we're here to talk about some work we did with extremely high resolution uh, deliveries. So um, I'm going to get started by talking about a little, uh, a little history for VR Playhouse. Um, so we're a creative studio and full service production company specializing in immersive content. And uh, we've been around since 2014. So uh, when we first started, our pipeline was, um, was very much not even this. It was, uh, we were stitching the videos in uh, like programs like Autopano and PT GUI, and then bringing them into programs like After Effects and Nuke for Cleanup. And if anybody's out there who has done this, please raise your hand because, uh, God, right? Like, I feel you. <laughs> I feel you. Just the, the pain of that is, is, is palpable, and I, I still, still get some, some night terrors uh, waiting for renders. Um, we experimented very early on before Cara VR was uh, e even around, when it was still just a, a, a glimmer in uh, John Stark's eye. Um, with using Nuke as a, a primary stitcher. You know, the idea here is, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could just do this all in one place, right? Get rid of the, um, the need for a five program pipeline just to, to get to a 360 video. Um, so, you know, very early on, uh, th this is a, a still from a project we did with Missing Pieces um, called uh, what, what was it called, 360? It was for uh, Honda, yeah. with Moses Sumney, where he appeared all around the camera in various points, and he was looping. He's a looping artist, and so he would uh, make his loops and then, and then leave himself, and he would leave this echo of himself behind, and it was all really awesome. It was a really great idea, uh, really technically challenging. And because of the technical challenges, it was, it, it was, we had to do it all in Nuke. So we used ST Maps. Um, and this is something that our, our technical director, Jordan Halsey, came up with, where we would take the, the, the UV map and put it into, we would stitch it in auto pano to calculate the stitch. And then we would um, take, an S, we would take a, a, a UV map um, with a, a red and, and uh, a yellow ramp, a red and green ramp, and then it would make yellow, yeah. And, and then we would export that as a still at the same resolution, dump it into, like change the file name, you know, replace it, it was like really hacky, right? Like put it back into Autopano, export it as a still frame, and then bring it into Nuke as the ST map, right? And that's how we would get our, our solve from Autopano into Nuke. And this actually worked out pretty well. Um, and uh, was, was like the way that we could use Nuke as a stitcher before Cara. Um, so when, when Cara came out, we were really excited to, you know, finally not have to do this anymore, right? Uh, all those little hacky ways that, that we uh, solved for 360 video in the early days. Um, we were also using Nuke in our pipeline uh, on some really early uh, experiments with Lytro on uh, doing light field video. Um, we produced a, a project for them called Moon. Uh, you may have seen it, maybe not, um, where uh, we used Nuke and Cara to replicate. You can see this is a, a light probe from the set. And that's 
their giant camera that's the first generation of it. And uh, we used, and you can see it here, replicated in Nuke. Um, you can see the map of, of all the different cameras there. And then how it all came together to create a volumetric video inside of Nuke, which was really incredible. Um, and, you know, this is just a whole different way of thinking about video, uh, even from 360. Like, already when we were back here, Nuke was a really powerful tool because previously we'd been doing our stitches in auto panel and then dumping them into After Effects, which doesn't have a 3D space. So if we had to resolve any kind of discrepancies, we would have to use like a, like a grid warp tool and do all these other things. With, with Nuke, we had Z space, so we could like kind of push things in and out to kind of match up. And that was sort of proved the basis, you know, the basis for this kind of work where we were able to, to use that Z space to our advantage. Um, once Car came out, we were really stoked because we had, uh, you know, now a tool inside Nuke where we could just do everything and keep it all in one, in one contained package. Um, so this is some work we did uh, with uh, Schieffer Chop Shop for Boost Mobile. Um, we had this, we had a 360 camera, I think it was one of the first GoPro Omni yep. shoots that we did. We had this 360 camera and it was on a uh, giant, I think we have a slide of it here, it was on a, uh, a giant um, spider cam going over two full blocks of Los Angeles, like two or three full blocks of Los Angeles. And they were doing this for a, a, a regular framed commercial and then gave us, you know, a, a chance to put the 360 camera on it kind of at the, at the end of the day and get a couple takes. And they had this elaborately choreographed set of, um, of, uh, of uh, uh, social media influencers that were, each became a different hotspot. And then we activated this on web VR and you could sort of go through and pause at different points in the video and hover over a social media influencer and get some more framed content about them. It was a really cool piece. Um, also, uh, also sort of ahead of its time. Um, and uh, CAR made the workflow, workflow really easy because you know, not only did we have this like, kind of camera moving across a really wide range, of, uh, wide range of space, but then we had this giant rig above us that we had to paint out as well as the, um, the wires. And so being able to do it all in the one software saved us just a, a ton of time. Um, here's a, a, a little Breakdown from that project. This is what one of our scripts looked like. So uh, w this this project was a r another um, another really interesting one for Cara. We were asked to uh, turn around the Coach Fashion Shoot or the Coach Fashion Show, the runway show, for an a on Tuesday. Right, Tuesday. Shot on a Tuesday. We yeah. Shot on Tuesday. Uh -huh. Multi-camera shoot. We had four cameras around. Five. Five cameras around. We partnered with uh, Prosper XR, who's uh, in the next room. They're doing a. Um, they, they do a lot of, of, of rovers. So we partnered with them and a couple other folks and went out to New York and um, had a f had a five-camera shoot that then had to be edited down and delivered in headset to customers in Simon Malls on Saturday. So Tuesday shoot, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday delivery. Like Saturday activation, not just delivery, activation. Um, I was in, I stayed in New York for that entire time. Darren went from New York and came back to LA to supervise post. Uh, production was, um, was very crazy. The, the, sh the whole fashion show was about 20, 30 minutes long. So there were no like, there was no like, oh yeah, we'll get it again or we'll, we'll pick that up. Um, we had to get it. We had our edit already done with previs out of Unity. So we knew what our camera positions were. We knew what shots we wanted. We knew where we wanted them, all these things. And then did the rough stitch in New York in the hotel room, did the edit there and, uh, and then had to ship, we shipped all the footage back via a like super fast upload to the studio in Los Angeles. 
And I want to let you take the last half of this story because it was pretty <laughs> crazy what happened. Um, so immediately after we finished shooting, we started uploading. That night we had compositors already compositing and, and sending shots back to us um, in New York. And then, and then I flew back and we continued the post process. And um, come delivery day, there was a massive power outage in Los Angeles. And we had to bring in a huge, huge generator. And we plugged in all of our render farm, all of our computers into this generator. Um, because we were working in one piece of software, which was, which was New Cara, we were able to still hit our delivery uh, Friday at midnight. It was, it was so nuts. I'm getting pictures of Darren from the studio. Like, we had to tow in a generator into the back lot of our studio, run, you know, huge, <laughs> like, three-phase power cables to everything. And, uh, and the fact that we still managed to hit the activation for Saturday was, was just so nuts. Um, you know, on, on already tight turnaround, we were able to, to, to nail it. Um, but the tightest turnaround we had was uh, for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. This was a, a spot we did um, for Verizon in conjunction with uh, Master of Shapes and uh, RSA and RGA. And for this one, it was, we shot on our custom uh, Sony A7 rig, it's a four camera rig, um, so that we could capture the high dynamic range uh, needed for, you know, to deal with the intense shadows of um, the, you know, New York. And we had from the first shot, like the fir the, from the first shot to delivery, 19 hours. Uh, to deliver a 30, 30 second spot. And we did this, we embedded in RGA, brought a, a whole, brought, our, brought a render farm with us, as well as three workstations, set up with artists at RGA, like in a conference room basically, and just like kind of like took it over and and had to, and like, we're like, you know, again, sending the data as soon as it got off the camera, it was like rushed back to the artist so that they could start stitching in Cara. Um, and we managed to, to, again, just barely hit our, uh, our, our deadline at 6 a.m. just in time for the, for the Macy's Day Thanksgiving parade. The, the reason for that turnaround was they, they wanted the commercial to include the inflation of the balloons with all these giant tanks of helium. It's pretty spectacular if you've never seen it. And, and they wanted to then air the spot during the parade. And so, you know, again, it was this, 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 uh, this kind of impossible situation, but um, it really, it was, it was Cara and, and being able to just, you know, throw out the renders and keep it moving that, that let us get there. Um, so that's a, a bit of our previous experience with 360 video. Uh, we've taken a, a, a lot of, um, kind of impossible jobs and made them happen. Um, and, and so it was, it was sort of uh, no surprise when we were met with our next challenge, which I'm gonna turn it over to Darren to uh, really <coughs> outline and, and highlight kind of what, the, the, what we were being asked to do this time. So it was about a year ago that um, we were approached with a concept for a new screen that was being built and we were told this would be something that had never been done before. So, of course, we immediately said, sign us up. Um, and so the objective was create four 10-second spots for the Atlanta Falcons' new stadium, the Halo. This was the largest LED screen in the world at 21,504 pixels by 1,152. Um, what was the actual size of the screen? It was oh. massive. Massive screen. I thought it was 70, isn't it 70,000 or 60,000 square feet of Six, LED screen? 60,000 yeah. square feet of LED screens, a full wraparound. Um, so this was the team. Uh, the concept for this was created by the Artery. Uh, they're an agency out of New York. They approached the Astronauts Guild to run production and camera solutions. And we were approached for post-production 
and stitching and, and to work with the team to figure out how we could achieve um, this feat. And we also brought in Radiant Images and they helped us with the camera solution. Um, this was the specs we were given. <laughs> We were told, if you see at the bottom here, it says content specs and sizes are not final and may change during the installation and troubleshooting of the displays and control systems. So we actually didn't know what exactly we, we would be delivering at the time. And there was no way of testing it because the stadium <laughs> had yet to be built. Um, this is where it was at when we started the production. Um, so we just started testing in the best way that we could and sort of in a hypothetical sense, uh, we started asking ourselves, are we gonna be able to pull this off? You have a massive data footprint. Um, you, you know, what we, what we were discussing was upwards of 48K that we would be ingesting. Eight minutes of that would equal a terabyte. Um, and, and at the time, we weren't even sure if we'd be able to render it, the, the graphics cards, capped out at 16K, and we would be needing to render at 21. We'd be needing to work in above 21. Um, so we actually had to take our 32 blades and reconfigure them so that they all at least had 96 gigs of RAM, uh, and that was the bare minimum we found uh, that would work in order to handle this kind of material. Um, we did a lot of testing. We looked at a lot of software. Car VR was the only software that could handle above 16K. Um, so we started to go down this road. I'll pass it off to Leo. You can take it from yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so it was interesting because when we started dealing with uh, the, the tests and so forth to figure out what kind of max resolution we could actually get out of this, you know, we started kind of joking to ourselves about the fact that you know, we, we continue to make all these advances from a technological standpoint and, you know, to, to back to Ian's point, in the beginning of all this, there were no tools, right? I mean, it was this kind of ad hoc collection of tools that, that you put together and being from a visual effects background, I'm kind of used to that scenario uh, because, you know, you, you never have w like a one size fits all hammer that's going to get you through the situation. So you're, you're kind of used to it. But in, in this regard, you know, we're making all these technological advances and you've got the top line graphics cards and top line technology. And yet this canvas that we're asked to paint on keeps getting larger, right? And you start thinking about the, the complications and challenges of a, a 20K delivery. Um, it seems like it would be relatively straightforward, but, uh, but when you really start kind of putting your, your whole pipeline through the test, you realize how quickly uh, you, you've really got to be preemptive on this stuff. So um, when we talked to the Ardor and we saw the creative, uh, you know, there were essentially four spots. Uh, Victory Lap, which is essentially just the, uh, I believe it was six or eight cars, right? Mm -hmm. six, six or eight cars, cars, just driving in a circle, right? Seemingly easy. You think that uh, you're, you basically have a, a set camera rig right in the middle and you're just going to drive the cars around at a certain distance and all will be well. Um, burnout was a little bit more complicated because you're basically, you have six to eight cars that are doing consistent power slides around the entire uh, sphere of, or not the sphere, but the, uh, the, the kind of spherical display in the stadium. Uh, blow by, which was, it was much more of a kind of choreographed dance. This is the way it was at least articulated to us by the director, uh, Vico Sharabani. So it was this interleaving of cars going in and out in this sort of uh, choreographed pattern. Um, so obviously lots to be concerned about with stitch lines and so forth. Uh, and then huddle, which, Seemingly would have been the easiest one because it's essentially cars that are just driving towards camera and they just need to stop a certain distance away. But uh, we opted to shoot that one notally, but even that one posed uh, quite a few challenges for us. Um, so this is where the really, you know, the rubber hits the road. And, and one of the things that's really exciting about Previs, especially on a project of this magnitude, is it's really the convergence point of all departments, right? It's this opportunity to really engage with your creatives, your production team, uh, the post company, uh, the agency, and just get everyone in the same room so you can really see how this is going to, to manifest uh, before you go and, and commit yourself to a, a specific technological path. Um, so the, the previs was really important for us. Um, so, you know, the, the artery had actually begun the previs process. Um, and that's what you're going to see here. 
Um, this represents less of a technical previs and more of just a, a ripomatic, right? It's, these are just basic animatics that you're going to see um, if you were boarding them out, and this is enough to sell an agency. But this doesn't really inform us um, how we're actually physically going to do this, or you know, because you're basically dealing with a full CG environment. Um, so it's it's sort of a best case scenario, right? You're not worrying about stitch lines and so forth. So this this was all well and good, but we really needed to to deep dive on this and figure out, you know, what does the actual technical previs look like for us? Um, and uh, at the end of it, once we started doing some previs, we thought, you know what? Why don't we just do this all CG, right? We won't have any stitch lines. We'll have uh, beautiful cars all the way through. We'll just go out and shoot background plates, right? I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's our answer for trying to get around some of these uh, complex issues. And it, frankly, in hindsight, it was, it, it was certainly a good option for us. Uh, but the agency and, and the, the creators were dead set against it. They wanted to go out and shoot the cars, which I totally understand. Uh, so, you know, we were basically a go on production. Now it was time to, to figure out how we can make this manifest. So you want to jump yeah. in on that? Hey, can, um, can, you, can you guys just talk, uh, yeah. talk a little bit about why, why, why the case for CG in this, in this scenario? Because th this would be interesting. This is like a good opportunity to kind of educate, you know, the, yeah. the, the larger you field as to it. what some of the challenges are when you're dealing with 360 video and, and why sometimes not filming is the right answer. So yeah. the, the first and, and the biggest one that we quickly realized was when you have a camera configuration like this, um, you know, you have, right here we have five lenses. As these camera, as these cars move around in what would be, you think, a normal circle, right? If I'm just following this edge here. Um, what would happen is, even though it's, you're in a perfect circle, your, your distance to the center of that lens is actually changing. And compounded by that is the barrel distortion of said lens. And each lens has a different um, sort of edge distortion that you start to hit. And what, in order for, if you really wanted a straight line or to appear as a straight line, the car would have actually have had to taken this path, um, which would have just been absolutely impossible. So we started to see, you know, we were gonna get some really weird stuff once we hit this stitch line. Beyond that, just the, sh the lighting, we're shooting practically in, in daytime. Um, you know, you have this variable lighting that's constantly shifting and Something that's really important with car commercials is the look of the car. And we realized that the cars facing to the north were going to have a completely different look than the cars facing to the south, uh, compounded by just the sheer amount of reflections that we wouldn't be able to control like you would on a normal shoot with plenty of lighting, bounce cards. We only had one light source, and that was the sun. So all of these things taken into account are prognosis to the agency was do this CG and, and they will thank you. Um, but they were, they were dead set on doing this practical. And so we said, okay, let's, let's do it. Let's figure this out. The camera that we knew would basically be the only one that would be able to handle um, or s provide us with the amount of resolution that we needed was the Red Weapon 8K. At the time, this was a very new camera. Um, they had just started upgrading their cameras to 8K. And we actually, you know, uh, bless Radiant's heart, they, they really came through on this one and were able to source some of the only cameras in Los Angeles. And we needed, we needed six of them. Seven, um, seven with, uh, with a spare. Oh, yeah, yeah. exactly. It was seven, with, just in case. Um, we looked at a lot of different lenses, and we'll go into that a little bit more. What we ended up on was the 14 millimeter Cook. Again, a very hard lens to find. Uh, one is okay. Finding six of them can be quite hard. Uh, this is not a normal lens for 360 video. This is a much smaller FOV than anything else we usually had shot with in the past. So that then began to present a, a additional challenges on what was going to be the best configuration uh, using this setup. So we decided on uh, a, two different camera configurations for blow-by, victory lap, and burnout. This was the configuration. It had six cameras. Um, 
we were basically taking our previs, bringing it through Maya, Houdini, and then stitching it. We were outputting individual cameras that were mocking up our, um, our shot and then stitching it in Nuke. And based on that data that we were getting back, we started to be able to see uh, what was going to be the best configuration. Um, that's also how we were able to choose our lenses. For Huddle, we decided to do a nodal shoot, so we shot half and half, uh, four cars at a time, facing north and south. Uh, this, is, this is what the camera rig looked like. You can actually uh, go check out the Sense 9 next door at Radiant. Uh, it was a monster. Uh, you can see, you know, one of the biggest things with stitching is al always parallax. The parallax between edges was massive. So, in deciding a lens, you know, we, we, had, we had a couple issues. A big one was the, the overlap of the configuration. We needed enough overlap between lenses so that we would have enough to stitch with. And the issue was the wider that we went with the lens, the farther away the car would appear. So we had to basically find a sweet spot between width and resolution um, to decide which lens was going to be best. And so this was a camera test we did behind Radiant, and we were able to see how close we could get within the center of the lens. But then we also needed to worry about where we would start to have overlap and make sure that we had enough and that our, ca our car was far enough away that we wouldn't lose them. Essentially, they would have just disappeared if they got too close to camera. And this, just to, just to touch on this too, this is actually one of the, I think, uh, the, the best sort of examples of, of why the previous process uh, from the technical side was so important and how it really helped us communicate between departments because as, as DJ was uh, at Radiant with, with the Astronauts Guild shooting all those tests, uh, we were back at, at VR Playhouse and, and working in Maya and Nuke and adjusting the cameras. So, you know, when they would, they would try a different focal length or a different lens, we would essentially do the same thing in, in previs. Uh, and it really kind of helped us create this whole ecosystem where, you know, we can give you guys feedback about, well, here are some of the, the key challenges we're going to find if the car gets within a certain distance uh, or if it's a certain, goal, certain angle. So it, it was really, I think, informative of, of how we ended up collectively coming to the, uh, to the lens selection overall and the camera configurations overall. So after thorough testing, we felt confident enough um, and we spent three days in production um, doing sort of, you know, mostly magic hour and, and high noon shooting. Uh, this, is, this is burnout. See, they're, they're drifting around camera. You can see our, our cones that we had that would sort of uh, markate how close they could get to camera. And this was the rig. This is the Astronauts Guild. Um, everything had to be wireless. And, you know, all, you always want to please client. And, and so we had to make sure that there was a way for us to be able to still see what it was going to look like. So we actually had two Teradex spheres that were doing a live stitch based on our um, wireless camera feeds um, that were about 200 yards from, from the camera. Yeah, you should uh, mention, like, one of the things that, uh, that DJ was saying was because of the way the, the cameras were set up and being so far away from uh, where the, the camera rigs were set up, they would essentially go out there. Everyone would run away back to the, to the, uh, the, the, the space. I, I don't even know what yeah, that space video was. Village. Yeah, video village. Yeah, it was a video village, but it, would, it was an old garage, yeah, or, garage. or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So they, we basically took over this garage and outfit that as, as video village. But, you know, once we were kind of greenlit to go ahead and, and do the shot based on, you know, the, the exact moment of magic hour, uh, they would have to go out, set up all the cameras, fire them off, and then drive away back to the main uh, village. So there was, you know, quite a, a bit of logistical challenges uh, overall on the production, uh, especially with the wireless feeds and so forth. Yeah, and, and so that also meant because we couldn't fire wirelessly um, and have confidence that, that we were actually capturing, they would go around, turn on everyone, check everyone, get in a car, take off, set the cars, and action. 
you have to think about all of the footage that's being burned as, as we're shooting 8K60 at these really low compressions, um, which we then had to deal with as we're shooting. So they were outputting QuickTime proxies in R3D files as we were, we were shooting faster, more than we could dump. You know, you had, we had six cards usually going at once, um, and it was just a constant struggle with that much media to try and keep up with production. And at one point, they actually had to send people two hours back to LA to get more cards uh, because we realized how much media we were, we were burning through for this shoot. So our pipeline, um, once, once we had in the R3Ds and the proxies on the drive, we were stitching those proxies on set. Um, that way we were able to review with the client and make sure that we were getting what we needed. Uh, once the shoot was done, we were back in Los Angeles. We did all of our editing in Nuke Studio. And then we were sending those dailies to New York, back to client. I'll pass it off to you here. Okay. Right, so um, that also was a, a fairly significant challenge on this project because we had basically all the, the people who were involved in principal production in LA, uh, whereas the agency uh, and client were in New York. Um, so passing these large files back and forth obviously posed a, a pretty significant problem. Um, so we were leveraging, we had to identify really quickly, like, you know, on a project like this, you have to imagine what the end goal is, which at the time was this 20K image with, with sort of a moving resolution target as well, uh, because they hadn't even spec'd out or finished kind of the technological um, deployment at the, at the stadium. Uh, so we didn't even actually know what resolution we were ultimately going to deliver until really the last couple of weeks. But in order to kind of future-proof the project, you have to think all the way to the final deliverable so that you can kind of determine the entire pipeline backwards, uh, especially on these more complex shows. Um, so in this regard, you know, we started working uh, early on with the, with the artery uh, to figure out how they were going to be reviewing with their client, were they going to be looking at it in a headset, uh, what was their, uh, their end goal for color grading? How are the clients going to view the material? Um, for us, it was, you know, based on the fact that we had Nuke and, and our pipeline is, is already kind of well established, uh, we already had our, our kind of situation worked out. We, we already started evaluating the footprint and knew what we were getting into. Uh, but how do you work sort of cohesively and, and seamlessly with other teams uh, that are spread far and field, uh, far and afield in the world. Um, so we, you know, ended up deciding on taking the footage originally through uh, Red Cine X, uh, and determined that EXR would be the way to go um, a, as a way to exchange files back and forth between us and New York. Um, and we obviously had to figure out some sort of compression scenario just because of the size of the files. Where I think when we first started, um, they were I think 270 megs of frame. Um, and if you're talking about four, seven to 10 second spots, it very quickly becomes uh, almost insurmountable in terms of the amount of data that we're passing back and forth. Um, but you know, that's where proxies and, uh, and really kind of an intelligent pipeline of working at lower resolutions while you're making your decisions uh, before prepping for final delivery. Um, so as you can see, we went into open EXRs, uh, and then we ultimately ended up doing our stitching at over 30K in resolution in CARA. Um, and uh, the advantage of that is obviously that, you know, we, we've got the ability uh, to, to be working interactively on the native footage in, in a non-sort of degraded workflow, right? I mean, everything is live. Uh, we're not having to commit to any specific uh, final look until we're ready to. Uh, everything's kind of dynamic, which especially helps us for cleanup and, uh, and a lot of the, like, uh, especially on blow by, for example, which, or, or burnout rather, uh, which involves the, uh, the cars basically doing power slides around the cameras, uh, dealing with all those semi-transparencies of smoke and dust and all these other things. If we didn't have Nuke and Cara and keeping it all live and dynamic, uh, we would have had a lot of generational losses because every render, you're essentially losing some resolution. Uh, so we try to maintain as lossless of a workflow as we possibly can. Um, when we started working with the, the, the finisher in New York, 
uh, he, we found out he was doing this in Resolve, uh, which did not have any capability over 10K, really, uh, which is not uncommon. Uh, so we ended up having to split our 20K uh, equirectangular output into two 10Ks just so that they can manage it uh, on their side. Um, and we also provided nuke scripts so that they can reassemble uh, and do all their final outputs uh, to send to the client and ultimately uh, the stadium by the end of it. So stitching is, is kind of like a muscle. The more that you work on it, the, the stronger that you get. No two shots are usually the same, whether it's your camera configuration, the movement through the stitch lines, time of day. Um, each, each shot has a very unique approach. And um, sometimes it, it takes experimenting and trying different things. Um, what's great about Cara is it gives you the full flexibility of trying these different things um, and combining different techniques. Uh, a lot of the other software we've found um, can get you part of the way, but, but usually you know, that last 10%, um, you're, you're locked in. And so each, each shot had, um, had its own quirks. The shots that we thought were going to be the hardest turned out to be the easiest, and the th shots that we thought were going to be the easiest turned out to be the hardest. Um, and so some of it was experimentation. Some of it um, you know, uh, was just years of, of, of doing this. Uh, we, we, the, there's the, the stitcher and, and the solver, and, and sometimes for specific shots, you know, we, we were keyframing every single frame. Uh, to get what we needed. Other ones, you know, uh, a keyframe here or there was enough to, to get us to the finish line. Um, the, but the most important thing was after you're done stitching, your, your work is not done. There's still a lot of cleanup. Um, we had a lot of things that we needed to remove from the shots. We had cones. Um, we had things in the background. Um, we even did some sky replacement, um, cleanup on the cars. We actually, for one of the shots, they weren't happy with huddle and the positioning of the cars. So we actually had to take one of the cars and, and move it over slightly. Um, but we did this all without leaving Nuke or Kara. And, um, and uh, it, was, it was a great success. Uh, we were very happy with how it turned out. And it was ready in time for opening game day of uh, Atlanta Falcons. So we're shooting a big job for Mercedes-Benz. Everything about it is big. We got eight great cars for Mercedes-Benz, six red helium cameras shooting at 8K, 60 frames per second. And it's gonna be projected on one of the largest screens in the world. The new home of the Falcons is officially open. The first thing that catches your eye, the video board. Officials boast that it's three times larger than any other stadium. A lot of technical challenges. We're super excited about it. Everything from experiential to VR to production. All of these things were figured out together with the agency and our great team. And we're super excited to uh, be shooting it. The really most important part of this job happened well before we even showed up. This job took a lot of planning and a lot of calculations and doing a lot of pre-visualization as well as working with Vico, figuring out how we can create his vision technically and still create a beautiful image. What makes this particular project kind of unique is that we're shooting on some very big cinematic quality cameras, which is a little abnormal for VR. But because of the scale of this, because it has so many cars and all these big elements, we were able to bring a very big upscale cinematic experience to this project. And ultimately, it's going to be in a huge football stadium. So it needs to be big, it needs to be epic, it needs to be aggressive. I think everyone here on this team has been pushing because no one's kind of known exactly what the layout of the land was going to be and so it's been great to have such a, a great crew and director and everyone just behind it focused on, on creating something that really hasn't been done before. 
we won't actually know if this works or not. <laughs> it still actually appears in the screen, there's no way. So we're up here, one of the best shoots ever. Thanks very much everybody. So I guess we have time for questions. Um, if anybody has any questions, we pass the mic around. Yeah, yeah. So within Nuke exists CaraVR or it's, is, I, I, I missed this, uh, I, I, I saw what you're talk, talking about with Autopano and all the things. So CaraVR is inside Nuke? Yeah, so the, the, the way it works is that there's Nuke, and then um, the same way, are you familiar with Ocula, which is the stereo tool set? So Car VR is similar to Ocula, where it's another, it's sort of an add-on tool set uh, with its own separate licensing. Yeah. Anybody else? So I learned anything here from Simon. <laughs> uh, I think it took eight weeks probably from the from the point when we first got contacted, and we did pre-pro for at least two, two and a half weeks, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, the, the shoot was three days, and then we, the, the post only took us about four weeks. Um, and then we had some kind of additional roundabouts as it actually started to, to uh, materialize what the actual specs were. Uh, there were some last minute additions that we had to do and so forth. But yeah, I think it was about, I think it was about eight weeks, all told. Not too painful. Yeah, one, uh, one, one, one other significant time measurement is that the renders themselves per frame were 15 minutes. Yeah. 15, 15, 15 one five. 15 to 20 minutes per frame. Per frame. How many frames a About 1,000, right? Yeah. 60. Yeah, we had, uh, we d did we deliver at 60 or 30? Delivered at 30. Yeah. Yeah, Shot we delivered at 60. 30. Delivered at 30. Yeah. So when we started, we were working, and we were also had to, to speed ramp some of the stuff. So we, we would start with 1,200 frames and then delivered, yeah, what, 600, 900? Yeah, yeah. 600. They're all about 8 to, to 10 seconds. Yeah. Any, Any other questions? Else? No. <laughs> I mean, the parallax was massive. It, it, was, it was definitely the most drastic. Out of any camera rig we've worked with, it was the most drastic parallax to reconcile. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. I think, you know, one thing I'll say in closing, um, you know, 360 video, uh, in, in specifically in VR, is about to take, uh, is about to take a, a whole new evolution um, in, in the coming year. Uh, it, out, on the, out on the show floor, there's a, a 5K headset um, that we uh, we actually have at our booth. It should be up and working by now. But um, it's uh, you know th this kind of massive resolution is going to start to become the norm. Mm -hmm. And when when you look at it, when you actually view content, and, and this is something that is really it's it's really hard to come by. When you when you can view content that is you know 8K stereo and above, 16K, 20K, in a headset that is actually matching and using all that resolution, it becomes a completely different animal than what we're used to seeing at, at 4K and uh, you know, 4, 4 and 6K as you know, the current specs usually are. So uh, I, to me, that's very exciting because um, I, you know, I do think that photo real VR can take on many forms, whether it's volumetric or, or 360 video or uh, you know, game engine rendered, and, and I think that this is going to be a, a really exciting time uh, for, for 360 videos just around the corner. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. Thanks.